Right, the part of uh, this chapter in 2 Chronicles 19 I want to focus on is the very first couple verses there. Bible reads in verse 1, And Jehoshaphat the king of Judah returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So what we have here, and I've gone over this story recently, relatively recently, within the past few months. What we have here is a, is a godly king. Overall, he's a good guy. King Jehoshaphat. He's a righteous king. He did some good things for God. He took the groves out of the land. He prepared his heart to serve God. Okay, here's someone that we could just say, he's a Christian, he's a good guy, he's doing good things for the Lord, but he's got a problem area in his life. And the problem area here is that he went and helped King Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, in, in war. He went and joined forces with him and was, was in union with him and was in one concord with him in his battles and in his fights. And... The Bible says here, and, and you know, not only that, he says, you know, we're like one person. You're like, I'm like your brother, right? We're brothers. We're in this together. We're all family. We're all good. Whatever it is that you need help with, I'm right there for you to stick close as a, as a you know, like a true friend. And this is an alliance. This is something that he shouldn't have been doing as a man of God, as someone who feared the Lord. And he's being rebuked by, by, by Jehu the son of Hanani, the seer, right? He was a prophet in the land. And he's being rebuked for going out and helping the ungodly. And it specifically says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? He's saying the people of Israel, and especially Ahab, he says they hate God. They hate God. So what are you doing going and offering your help, offering your resources and loving on them when they hate God? He said, that's wrong and that's wicked. And this is a concept today that's in our society that people think that Christians ought to love everybody. Well, you ought to just love everybody. You ought to just help everybody out. Well, we could see clearly here from this verse that that's not always the case. You can have a great heart to serve God. You can be a Christian person that wants to do what's right and to help people out when they're in need, but there is times when you might be doing that in error and in fact actually bring wrath upon yourself unintentionally from God. Do you think King Jehoshaphat wanted to bring wrath on himself from God? Absolutely not. He never even thought that he'd be bringing wrath on himself. He was, what I believe he was doing this out of ignorance... But he got rebuked, you know, through ignorance or not, you're still going to bring judgment upon yourself from God when you're, when you're doing things that are wrong, when you're doing things that he doesn't want you to do. You know, you're going to be, you know, disciplined. You will get chastised. You will get rebuked. And um, this is what happened with King Jehoshaphat. And again, you can look through his whole life. He was, he was um, pictured in the Bible as someone who was, who was a good king. He did good things for God. He was one of the good kings as opposed to one of the evil, wicked kings. So this happens, and it, and it can happen to many people. And today we have legitimate Christians, believers. They love the Lord, but they're mixed up on this idea of how we ought to be loving them that hate the Lord. Now, this concept, and, and the title of my sermon this morning is Sympathy for the Devil. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to break into the wicked song that the Rolling Stones put out, but it still is, this is a concept that, that Christians ought not to have. This is something that's been going on of having sympathy for the devil. Why should we be sympathetic towards the devil, towards our adversary, towards the angel of, you know, the, the angel of light that rebelled against God, that wants to be like God, and wants to get all of us away from God and to serve him instead of God? Why would we have sympathy for the devil? And you could say, oh, I don't have sympathy for the devil. Why would I have sympathy for the devil? For right. But people have sympathy on the children of the devil. And this is actually the concept that uh, Luciferianism teaches. So if you're familiar, it's, it's, it's Satanism. 
It's, it's satanic. You know, a lot of people, when you hear the word Satanism, you just think like, oh, there's people that like are into the, to black magic and they, you know, they worship a, a, a red devil with a pitchfork and they just are all about death and destruction. Well, those people are out there. Sure. I mean, there's people like that. But the, I think a, the bigger Satanism that exists are the people who think, you know, they're into the occult, which is the hidden knowledge. And they actually view Satan as a good person, as someone who's just misunderstood. Oh, you don't get it. See, he actually tried to do good when he was telling Eve to eat of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, well, I mean, it's knowledge. You know, God's the bad one for withholding knowledge from man. Why would you want to withhold knowledge? Knowledge is a good thing. You know, everyone promotes and loves knowledge. And says, well, see, the devil is just trying to help him out. Lucifer was trying to help him out. He was actually cared about, about man to help him, to, to give him this knowledge. And that's the way they spin it, right? Ignore the fact that God commanded them not to eat of it. That you're completely disobeying and disregarding God's commandments and what God says to be right and true and just and just going after what Satan says. But see, this is the way that they spin it. Say, oh yeah, the Bible's kind of skewed and he really is an angel of light bringing, you know, because the Bible even calls the, you know, Satan the, the angel of light. And that's why it's no surprise when he influences people and the sons of the devil look on the outside like good people. And I just preached yesterday at the, at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, I preached about hypocrisy and that was involving the Pharisees. And uh, the Pharisees, many of them, were false prophets who were, who were children of the devil. And on the outside, they made themselves look really nice. They made themselves look like, hey, we're serving the Lord. Hey, we're so righteous. We're living a clean life. We're doing all this. But on the inside, they weren't. They didn't believe any of it. And they were actually hypocrites. And they would do the things that they taught against. And that's who they were. And those are the ministers of Satan. See, they appear as light. They appear as good. They appear as someone that's holy and, you know, and just and, and righteous. But they're really not at all. They're the ex exact opposite. They're the wolves in sheep's clothing that we are told to, uh, to beware of. Because what's a wolf? I mean, a wolf is out to, to destroy the lambs, to eat the sheep, right? But when he puts on the clothing... He's, you know, he's trying to infiltrate and say, oh, look, I'm a sheep just like you before he devours one, gets close enough to devour him. And that's what we need to look out for. And there's many um, <clears throat> false prophets out there that fit that description. And those people we ought to have no sympathy for. Those children of Belial. Now, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 1. I was just out soul winning on Friday morning and I ran into a guy that was, that was saved at the door when we were out in California. He was saved going to a, a Southern Baptist church and uh, he was a chaplain. So, I, you know, we were talking to him. He knew, he knew some Bible. He knew, you know, he knew some stuff, but what he didn't know and what he wasn't aware of, see, when we first started talking, he's like, oh, wait, is that the church? You know, we, when we said, yeah, we're visiting from Verity Baptist Church. Oh, is that the church, you know, where that pastor said those things? But, you know, and we're like, yeah, that's, you know, that's the same thing. Well, I don't agree with that. And he's like, yeah, he's like, well, you guys probably don't agree with that either. And I was like, well, actually, I do. You know, I, I, I agree with that. And I said, I, I pastor a church in Arizona. I said, I agree with what he said 100%. And I said, are you familiar with a reprobate doctrine? Do you, do you, have you ever heard of, of people who are reprobates? He's, he's like, I don't even know what that is. He, he was unfamiliar with it. He didn't know. He's like, I've never heard of that before. He's like, well, just tell me about it, you know. And here's a guy, though, he was, uh, and he was very receptive and willing to listen and not just shutting out. And, you know, I could, t I, with some people, you're not quite sure if they're, if they're, if they're saved, if they actually believe, um, you know, kind of based on their spirit. Normally, you kind of, you know, the more you go soul winning, you'll realize this when you run across people who are saved. There's a common spirit. I mean, there's a, there's a common brotherhood. You know, I mean, you, you, you kind of sense that they're your brother in Christ and they receive you as a brother when you, when you 
you know, both say, hey, yeah, we're saved. You know, we're, we believe the same thing. We're, we're brothers in Christ. And that's, that's what I had with this guy. You know, he was definitely, I would say, as far as I could tell, the best of my ability to discern this guy is, is saved. And we're having a good conversation with him. Now, he never said that he agreed with what I was saying, but he gave the opportunity to hear it out. But what's interesting is just the fact that here's a guy... He's a chaplain. He's involved in ministry work. He's involved with, with, you know, help teaching the Bible. And he didn't even know anything about this reprobate doctrine. Right? Now, I get it. There's not that many people really teaching this anymore. It has been taught for a long time. It's been taught all, I mean, it's in the Bible, so we know that it's there. It's not some new doctrine that's just come up. And you could, you could look this up. The reprobate doctrine going back even in, even in other grains of, of, of Christianity, you know, if you want to say they weren't saved, fine, but they were teaching it too. You know, I mean, it's not like this is just um, something that's brand new. And um, so I, I went through that with him because what you need to have is the context and the understanding that there are people that hate God just as Jehoshaphat didn't know. He didn't know that he wasn't supposed to just go out and help these guys because, hey, physically they were brothers, right? Physically they're all children of Israel. But that doesn't matter to God. What matters is that, hey, they hate the Lord and you're going and helping them. And you don't need, don't, not only do you not help them, don't love them. Don't love them. I thought we are supposed to love everybody. Yeah, that's the lie you've been told. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to see an attitude towards God, that God has towards people who have rejected Him and that hate Him and that, that you know, then if they ever want to come to Him again, you know, after they've already been rejected, let's see how God responds. Look at Proverbs 1 verse 24. <clears throat> Starting in verse 24, the Bible reads, Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof. So we see here, first of all, it's an important point that, you know, like the Bible says, for God so loved the world. We see here God's love being extended to people. God's love is extended to all people at some point in their life. Always, when they start off, God's love is being extended. It's being extended. He's saying, I'm calling. I'm calling unto you. I want you to be saved because the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God is calling. He says, but you refused. And in order to refuse, that means you heard the call and refused. He's not saying, I've called, but you just didn't hear me. Right? right? He's saying, I've called, but you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You, see, you, don't, you don't even care. My hand is out for you. I want to help you. I want to lift you up. I want to save you out of the pit of hell. Here's my hand. They don't regard. He says, you've set at naught all my counsel. You made it like nothing. He said, all, all my counsel, all my law, everything that I say that you need to be doing, doesn't matter. And would none of my reproof, even when he tries to correct you and, and give you the instruction, didn't want to hear it. This is, this is the people that he's talking about, okay? Verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. A calamity when things are going really bad in your life and you have all kinds of things going on and you know, all kinds of struggles. He's saying he's going to laugh. I will mock when your fear cometh. Right? Now normally, these people that have this, this attitude of yeah, you've called me, but I don't want to hear any of that. I don't want to have anything to do with you, God. It's pride. They're proud. They're lifted up. They're lifted up in themselves, and they think they've got everything taken care of. They think they don't need God. They think everything's just fine. And he's saying, you know what? When your fear cometh, because it's going to come unto everybody, no matter, I mean, especially those that have a lot of pride and that just reject God, he says, your fear is going to come. And when it comes, I'm going to mock how would you like to have God mocking you while you're going through like some of the lowest points of your life? Yeah. Just talk about adding you know, insult to injury. But look, this is the attitude that God has towards these people. And it's a righteous attitude. God's not some wicked God. He's a righteous God. And God is a loving God. But look, there's times when God's love is not towards people. 
when he tries and tries and give him chances and he's calling to him, he says, I want you to be saved. I love you. I want you to have this gift. I paid for it all. It's free. Just believe me. Put your faith on Jesus. Nope. Don't want it. Yep. Heard about it. I understand it. Don't want to have anything to do with it. When you, when you, when you slap God in the face by, in, in that way of just refusing that free gift, yeah. he says, okay, have it your way. You've made your decision. Verse 7, When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Now, this is the attitude that God has. If God has this attitude towards a person, do we think that we're better than God to just say that, well, no, we need to help. If God's not going to help this person, then I'm going to go help this person. At that point, that's when we're helping the ungodly. That's when we're, when we're loving those that hate God. And that's going to bring wrath then upon us. Because here's the thing. If God's bringing judgment upon people, if God is angry and is putting wrath on them, and you're going to, to fight against what God's doing, you don't want to be in that, in that situation. Even though you're a believer, even though you're a child of God, don't put yourself in that situation and don't think you know more than God does and be able to, you know, you, we need to be able to discern who are these people and what are they, and what are they talking about? And it's spelled out as we, we saw in second Chronicles 19, it's spelled out in Romans one. And we see it here. It's the same uh, teaching, the same doctrine being taught about the people that hate God, the people that knew God, but glorified him not as God, became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. And they, they, just as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is the type of person that we're talking about. Now, that's not what my entire sermon is about this morning. It's, it's probably the most important aspect as far as just understanding that and why, you know, why there's so much confusion and there's so many people, even Christians are condemning churches like ours and churches like Verity and churches like Faithful Word and Steadfast and all the others, Old Path, you know, all these other men of God that believe this were getting, you know, hammered by, well, by the world, but you expect that. You expect to get, to get the, the persecution and, and everything from the world. Of course that's going to happen. That ought to happen. You know, if we're doing anything right, that's going to happen. But what you ought not to be getting is the rebukes and the, and the, and the you know, the, the people crying against this from people who are actually saved. From the Jehoshaphats. The Jehoshaphats are the world that, that want to go out and help and love those that hate God. They need to understand this doctrine and not to have sympathy for the devil or his children. The world's promoting tolerance. The New Age religion teaches the, you know, the coexist. I'm sure you've seen those bumper stickers. Oh, coexist. You know, all these religions. What's funny, though, and I, and I should have brought this up. I had this as a point in my sermon yesterday about the hypocrisy, is they teach toleration. Like, oh, well, you need to tolerate everything. They say it in a way that's like, oh, the, 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 you know, the speak out of one side of the mouth saying, tolerate everybody, tolerate everything. But then when we say, you know, the sodomites ought to be executed, well, they don't tolerate that. Well, I thought you tolerated everyone. That's, well, that's our religious belief. Well, I thought you tolerate all religions. Or, yeah, all religions except true Christianity. What they want you to do is just tolerate sin and tolerate wickedness and tolerate every false way. That's what they want. Right. They want that type of a tolerance, which is a hypocritical tolerance because they don't take it to the full extreme of saying, well, hey, if we're promoting tolerance of everything, then you ought to tolerate everything. But no, they just want us to tolerate wickedness and perversion and people that hate God. And sorry, that's never going to happen. Amen. We also ought not to get deceived by the justifications for sin and become sympathetic towards sin. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. 
abhor is a really, really, really strong hatred for evil. And again, you know, we, we don't want to be uh, brainwashed into thinking this love, 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 and just love everything. Love everyone, love everything all the time. No. In order to have the right love, we need to also have the right hate. And hating that which is evil, see, and, and the, the media and the television and the movies are great at getting you to have sympathy towards that which is evil instead of hating it. Here's how they do it. They, 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 they present sin in a way to get you thinking, well, I'm sympathetic towards this sin because maybe I've done it or I know someone that's done it. Or I've, you know, I start to hear the whole story and how they kind of went down this path and everything. But the Bible doesn't teach us to, to have that sympathy. Now, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Empathy is being able to feel what someone else is going through. And sympathy is just kind of like showing pity and being sorry for that person. But the sympathy that we ought not to have, if we're going to abhor that which is evil, you've got to make strong stands against it. You've got to be able to say, this is wickedness. We're not going to tolerate this. And, you know, the way they do is they'll, they'll you know, with adultery, for example, They'll try to show, oh, my husband's not, uh, not listening to me. He's not doing it. You know, he, he's, he's not having a good relationship with me. He's real distant. And here's this other guy. He's real interested in me and everything else. And, and they'll show you how, oh, you know, we had this horrible argument. And he said this nasty thing to me and all this other stuff to justify going out and committing an extremely wicked, abominable sin and try to get you to feel sorry for that person that goes out and commits a sin worthy of death. And we ought not to have that type of view of it. We say, well, no, you commit adultery. What were you thinking? I'm not going to be sorry for you for going out and committing adultery. No matter what was going on in your life, that is where we draw a line and say, I'm going to abhor that which is evil. Now, if someone commits adultery, it doesn't mean you're not going to go out and try to get them saved if they're unsaved. I mean, the world is a different thing. And, and getting them saved, bringing salvation to them, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is this acceptance and growing toleration of wicked. I mean, that's how we get to the point we're at now. And it's only going to continue to get worse the more we just, oh, well, we can't say anything about this. We can't say anything about that. We can't judge about anything. Might as well just accept all this wickedness and sin. No. We need to abhor that which is evil. We need to hate it. We need to hate it as a society. We need to hate it as a church. We need to hate it as people of God. You know what? I hate adultery. I hate everything about it. And that's why I preach against the Hollywood movies. That's why I preach against the stuff on TV. That's why I preach against the music. Because I hate adultery. And all of those things are going to lead people into adultery one way or another. And I hate it. Amen. And I'm not going to offer, you know, sympathy for someone that goes out and commits adultery. And that's just one example. There's, there's many examples here that, um, you know, we can't just have this accepting attitude of sin. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 19. We're going to go into God's law where he teaches this concept and, don't, and you know what? A lot of the scripture is going to come from the, from the Old Testament, but not all of it will be. There's definitely going to be some New Testament reinforcing this concept. Okay? But even if there wasn't anything in the New Testament, it doesn't nullify what God has written in the Old Testament. We're Bible-believing Christians. We believe that, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It comes from God. God's the one who authors the Bible. It's His words. We know that God doesn't change. And we know that, that His words in the Old Testament are profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for, for, you know, for, for us to, to get our basis on what we believe. It all has to be taken as a whole. It all has to be taken in context. But it's all still good. And, and these things that we're going to be reading about have not been specifically just nullified in the New Testament. And that's what we believe here is that unless God in, in, you know, in the New Testament has said, you know, hey, 
This has been fulfilled. Hey, this is no longer being followed. For example, the, the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. Those have been fulfilled in Christ. Observing the Sabbath day. Yeah, you know what? Christ is our rest. And, and that has been fulfilled. And, you know, there's, there's scripture that, that points to, okay, this is for the time then present. And now we're, we're not observing anymore, but simply because of the fact that it's been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It was a picture it was an illustration to help them to understand more about the Christ that was to come. And it's been fulfilled, so we don't observe those things anymore. But he didn't fulfill all of the law. And that's why Jesus Christ himself said, Think not that I came to destroy the law. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. He didn't come to get rid of the law. He didn't come to get rid of the Old Testament. Look at Deuter Deuteronomy 19. We're going to look at verse 11. <clears throat> we're going to see some, some crimes and some punishments associated with those crimes and how we ought to handle them. Verse 11 says, But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities. So this is someone that commits first degree murder. He hates his neighbor. You know, he sets a trap where he lies in wait for him. He comes up against him and he kills him. Right? Pretty simple. Verse 12, Then the elders of his city shall fend, send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. But look at verse 13. He's saying, okay, well the punishment, the crime was first degree murder. The punishment is the death penalty. Verse 13, Thine eye shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. Notice, it doesn't give you the reason why he hates his neighbor. You say, well, maybe he's got a good reason to hate his neighbor. Maybe his neighbor just continually is, is you know, stealing his stuff or his neighbor is continually is, is doing things and, 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 you know, provoking him and just continually uh, uh, violating him in some way. If he hates his neighbor, he lies in wait for him and he kills him, he's commit first degree murder. There's no justification for doing that. He's not, you know, you know murdering, killing him in self-defense. It's a murder. And he says, don't pity that person. You don't have to extend love and, and sympathy on the guy. Oh, I'm so sorry. You got to be put to death now. Don't pity him. He's a murderer. That's what he deserves. That's what he got. And you know, the whole point for that is to make it so that people can have the strong difference. See, we, what we don't want is a grayscale of wickedness. Of, well, this is bad, but see, there's this other justification. And this is kind of bad, but, but there's reasoning behind it. You know, and, and it's this shifting gray area of, well, how bad is it really? It needs to be just clear cut. You know what? Murder's bad. Murder's wrong. Don't go out and kill people. Don't go out and commit adultery. And we're not going to have pity. Sarah, sit down in your seat right now. We're not going to have pity on these people when they commit crimes such as this. Look at verse number 16 in the same chapter. Flip down a few verses. Verse 16, it says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more such any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Here's an example of someone who's bearing a false witness, someone who's lying. An accusation comes against somebody. And, of course, the, the, the person who was accused is saying, whoa, whoa, no, I didn't do that, you know, and this guy's saying, yes, you did. So you've got a he said, she said type of situation. Well, one of them's lying. Right? And what they do is they say, okay, well, we need, to, we need to, to inquire about this. We need to get to the bottom of this matter. And they set up, you know, people, some judges to, to kind of figure out the facts of the situation and actually see what's going on. And it says, if it's found out that someone just brings an accusation against someone, like say, hey, man, I saw this guy murder this dude. I saw him, I saw him kill this guy. And it's just a lie. It's just a fabrication. 
Well, what they, the punishment is, okay, well, the punishment for that guy would have been death if he actually committed that murder. But since you accused him of that and that's what he would have been facing, you're being put to death now. And you know what? That's, a, that's pretty strong. That's a good law. Because what that does is it, it, you know, it doesn't allow people to say, oh, but all he did was say some words. How, how, could, how could he be put to death just for, just for saying a lie? Just for telling a lie? Well, because his words would have caused that other person to be put to death. And you could say, oh, yeah, but he didn't really mean it. You know, he didn't really actually mean what he said. No. Don't pity that person. Whatever judgment comes upon him is righteous. And see, the whole point is so that everyone could hear. Oh, man, did you hear about that guy that lied about, about the so-and-so? Yeah, that happened to him. He didn't even do those things. And it happened to him. And people say, wow, I better watch and be very careful about the things I say and the people I accuse of committing crimes. Because I don't want that happening to me. And this is a very strong deterrent for these crimes to happen. But in order to carry out a sentence, in order to actually execute what God has ordained and said, this is a righteous judgment and this is what you need to do, you can't have pity on these people. You have to be able to just go through with it and say, this is God's righteous law and that is the way that, that it's going to be done. And we're going to hate that evil. We're going to hate the wickedness of the false witness that's going to try to put someone else to death or cause them to, to, to suffer for some other crime that they never did and that is such a wicked thing we hate that we hate people that do that we hate that happening and this is a judgment and we're not going to pity them you brought that on yourself you commit adultery you brought that on yourself you commit murder you brought that on yourself you bear false witness you brought that on yourself personal responsibility turn if you would to chapter 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 13 we see a couple more examples of this Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse number 6. The Bible reads, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Abigail, go throw that away in the garbage right now. So this is talking about, okay, someone who's really, really, really close to you. Whether it be a family member, a brother, sister, your, you know, the, your own wife. I mean, how much closer can you get than these relationships? Your own immediate family, your wife, or some friend that's just like, you know, like David and Jonathan were friends. So someone that's just, you love them like your own soul. It's a really good friend. If someone like that comes up to you, it says... And telling you, hey, forget the Lord. Forget God. Let's go, let's go serve this other God. Here, this is, this is where we want to. We, you know, forget God. We, there's this other idol. You know, let's go serve Baal. Verse 7 says, Namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him. So don't listen to him, nor hearken to him. Don't agree with him. Don't listen to him. Neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people." I'd be surprised if this chapter or these verses are being read almost anywhere yeah. across the world yeah. today. And it's a shame because this is God's righteous law. And one of the things that we can learn from this, I think, which is very important, because you can look at that and be like, whoa. Whoa. You mean just believing in, like, in Islam? You know, if my, if, my, if my spouse wants me to, to convert to, to Islam from, from serving the Lord, from Christianity, they deserve the death penalty? Yeah. And not only that, according to the Bible, it says your hand should be first upon them. That's tough to swallow these days. But here's what that's teaching. We need to love God 
supremely. He's number one. His first two commandments were about him being number one in our life. And here is also why this is so dangerous. Believing on the Lord, believing on Jesus Christ brings salvation. It, it, it saves souls from an eternity of hell and leading people into the false way, into Islam and you know, Buddhism, into any other false way is literally not just damaging to yourself as a person, but everyone around you that you're trying to basically bring to hell with you. Right. That's eternal consequence. That really is a serious sin. And these people, that's why the Bible says in, in Galatians chapter 1, you know, if any man bring any other, uh, preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. And that's why when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door and they try to preach their false gospel to me, you know, I might give them one or two admonitions, but if they're not going to receive God's word and they're bringing false gospel, I let them be accursed. I let it be known, hey, you're preaching a wicked false gospel from hell. You're sending people to hell with your false damnable heresies. You need to repent or you're going to die and go to hell. And, you know, I, I tell them, you know, not to, and they haven't been back to my house since I, since I cursed them out last time, telling them what, you know, what they were doing and, um, but that's what Galatians 1 teaches. Why? Because it's so important you know, with what they're doing, with, with bringing people to hell. And it's so important when someone, even if it's someone close to you, is trying to do that you know, according to God's law. Now look, this, is this the law of the land today? No. Does, is our nation you know, claiming to follow God's laws? Of course not. That's not the way it is. But these are part of God's perfect laws for his sanctified nation. This is the model. And it says not to even pity that person. And that might be hard to say, well, how can I not pity my own wife, my own daughter? It's having the proper hatred of evil and wickedness and love for God. To love him that much to say, man, if you're going, if you are literally fighting against God and hating God and being the enemy of God like that, to just lead people away from him, I love God more than I love you. And you are causing all kinds of damage. And this is the way that 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 was dealt with. And that's the way that he, he put in his word. It says in verse 9, you know, Thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God. Which is, I mean, that's literally like one of the worst things that people could do. You know, leading you away from God. God provides the light. God provides the answers. God tells us what we need to be doing in our life. And if you're trying to be removed from the Lord... You know, that's that's kind of goes to the root of, of um, what you need in your life and bringing you away from that is uh, is extremely wicked. It says what brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. And God already warned him, you know, that when they didn't eliminate all the people of the land, all the heathen, the, the, you know, the, the, and bring his proper judgment upon them that it was going to be like a cancer. It was going to infect them and it was like leaven and it's just going to spread. And that's exactly what happened. This, this should show us more than anything else that we ought not to have a soft spot for wickedness when it comes to God's law. Even if it's someone that's close to you. Now, uh, you're in... Oh, you're still in Deuteronomy 13. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, certain men, look at this, the children of Belial, children of the devil. And I firmly believe this about when the Bible is referring to children of Satan, children of the devil, children of Belial, that just as much as you are a child of God, a child of the Lord, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again, 
Just as much as you can never be unborn, just as much as you could, you're always a part of God's family and you are a child of God, just as much as my children are my children, they can never be unborn. Nothing can change that. Nothing can change that when you're saved, you have eternal life and you're a child of God. When someone actually becomes a child of the devil is, when, is the moment they become reprobate and they can never be unborn as a child of the devil. That that is where they are at now, and they are damned for eternity. I mean, they're rejected. And they are then a child of the devil, a child of Belial. So here we're talking about certain men, in verse 13, the children of Belial are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you. And look, I mean, he's saying you need to figure, you know, you can't just go off of some wild accusations here. You know, this is, this is a serious matter. It's a big deal. You need to be certain. You need to be for sure that this is going on. Well, why? Because look at what they do. Verse 15, look at the judgment. Thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly. I mean, completely destroying the city and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof, with the edge of the sword. And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof, and shalt burn with fire the city, and all the spoil thereof every whit, for the Lord thy God, and it shall be an heap forever. It shall not be built again. And there shall cleave naught of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. There is a need for justice and judgment to be served when these, when these crimes are committed. You know, you can have mercy and forgiveness on people without losing the sense of justice and judgment. And in fact, that's exactly what God did for us. He extended mercy and forgiveness unto us, but the punishment for our sins still had to be paid. So God can show mercy, God can show forgiveness, but the, the judgment of his law still needs to be satisfied. And that, of course, is why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us and took our sins on himself and paid for those sins when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead because the judgment still needed to be paid. So God's mercy and God's forgiveness doesn't come at just the, the wave of a hand. And just saying, well, everything that you did is forgotten. No, it's not forgotten. It's forgotten because it's been paid for through Christ. It had to be paid one way or another. It had, the payment had to be made in order for that justice to be served. And in our society, we ought to have laws that bring justice and have righteous judgment against crime. Now, individually, you can still... For example... Let's say someone, God forbid, were to kill one of my daughters, right? Murder them. The righteous judgment would be that they should be put to death. That would be justice being served. Now, I can individually have mercy and show my own personal forgiveness over a person like that. However, they still need to be put to death and executed according to the judgment of the law. That is the way that our Christian mercy or love or anything like that ought, can be extended to people, but the law still needs to be in place and enforced because it goes beyond just that person transgressing against me personally. I mean, this has to do with sin just being rampant and abounding and the wickedness of the world. We saw in the days of Noah, before uh, the, the days of Noah, when man had gotten really wicked before God, that was prior to God instituting the death penalty. When, uh, you know, when Cain slew Abel and then the world just continued to get more and more wicked and, and violent, you know, the earth was filled with violence. He destroyed everything. He had to wipe them out. And as soon as Noah came off the ark, he's saying, okay, here's a new rule. Many men, uh, uh, you know, shed blood or kill, you know, kill man, then by man his blood shall be shed. That's the new, that's the new law. That's the new justice of, of, of the, the law of the land that God ordained. And it's a righteous one because the people, and we've heard this over and over again, the people shall hear and they're going to fear when the crimes are being um, 
justly recompensed. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And by the way, we, you know, our, our, our system is so screwed up already as it is, you know, with people not getting just judgments and just penalties. But not only is the, is the, um, the judgments not, not what they ought to be. For example, you know, a pedophile getting a couple years in prison and, and some therapy or something, you know, as opposed to being put to death. Not only is, is, it, is it unrighteous judgments or um, sentences, it's also not done very quickly. Right. Court cases go on for years and years and years and years, and our system is so convoluted and so just, just ridiculous now. And that is actually very harmful for the society also. Ecclesiastes 8.11, I'll read this for you, says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What's saying is that because you're not bringing the sentence speedily, when someone does evil, when someone does harm, when someone goes out and commits a murder, when someone goes out and steals, when someone goes out and does these things, you need to answer swiftly. Right. Now, get all the facts, get all the, you know, be able to make a righteous judgment in the matter. But that shouldn't be taken years in order to gather the evidence to put together and say, he either did it or he didn't do it. And if you do it, guess what? Within a few weeks or whatever, the judgment's going to be carried out and executed. Because what happens now, I mean, people are on death row, right? They've already been determined, hey, they're guilty, they're worthy of death. But what happens? Years and years and decades go by and they're still alive. And people say, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? I hate this guy. I'm going to go kill him. And what's the worst that's going to happen? Oh, well, they're going to throw me in a prison. I'm going to get some meals. I'm going to be able to work out. I'll be able to watch some TV, whatever. And, and okay, that's the worst that's going to happen to me? It's wickedness. And, that, and that's going to just promote more violence and more wrongdoing because... For one, it's not a righteous judgment. And for two, if it is a righteous judgment, it doesn't come speed. It's not happening like boom. Well, someone's thinking like, man, if I commit adultery, I might be put to death by like next month. That's pretty serious. Psalm 19, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And this is for all those people who want to say, oh, you know, you, you preach the law. You're so legalistic. You know, I can't believe you. Wait. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. I mean, the, the law is, the Bible even tells us, you know, the law is a schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. We need God's law. We need God's law today, still. People need to know that they're sinners and the soul needs to be converted. But it also says that the law of the Lord is perfect. So don't tell me that, oh man, you're so, you know, you're so hateful because you want to put an adulterer to death. We shouldn't do that. I mean, maybe it should be against the law, but we shouldn't do that. Oh, so now God's perfect law, you just know better than God now all of a sudden. It doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, the same people that say, oh, yeah, sodomy, you know, they should just be able to do whatever they want to do. They're not hurting anyone. Well, the Bible says it's a crime that's worthy of capital punishment. Do you, do, I mean, is God's law perfect or not? Amen. Is it? Because I still believe that it is. Amen. Amen. Keep reading here. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. God's statutes are right. They're not wrong. This is righteousness rejoicing the heart. Hey, God's law makes me happy. I'm glad that God laid out these laws. I'm glad that God put out the punishments that are associated with them because you know what? If a, if a people were to follow them, that would be a righteous people. If a people would put these laws into place, it's a righteous nature. I mean, the Bible even says, you know, the people were going to hear and see, wow, what a wise people that have laws such as this. God must truly be among them because they are so wise to have these laws. That's what it says in the Old Testament. The Bible says here, let's keep reading, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, 
enduring forever the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. It's a warning. God's laws are a warning. But in keeping them as a great reward, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great for you. It's going to be best for you. God's laws are definitely still applicable today, are needed to be followed today. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to wrap things up here. So the title of the sermon is Having Sympathy for the Devil. We covered, you know, the reprobate and those that hate God and not having sympathy, not pitying, not sparing when people commit these, these horrible sins, especially these sins that are worthy of death. And notice, you know, the Bible's not talking about pitying the person that steals for a piece of bread. That's not found in the Bible where it says, thine eye shall not pity him. It's talking about putting people to death. It's talking about when, when, when someone deserves something that's worthy of the death penalty, you know what, your eye shouldn't pity that person. Now, you could show pity on the person that's, that's hungry, they're starving, they need some food, and they steal. I mean, they still deserve a punishment. They still ought to be judged according to the law. However, having pity on someone for, for in, in a situation like that is different than someone, like I said, who commits adultery, someone who commits one of these capital crimes. There is a difference there. <clears throat> but there's people that we shouldn't even be praying for. Not for their good, at least. I'm going to read for you from Jeremiah in, verse, in chapter 14. You're still in 1 John 5, because that's going to be our New Testament example of this. Jeremiah 14.10 says, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have, have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people, for their good. God told Jeremiah not to pray for the children of Israel for their good. He said, don't pray for them. They've loved to wander. They've been committing all this sin. And you know what? I'm not accepting them. And I'm going to bring judgment upon them. Therefore, don't pray for their good. Don't pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Don't pray that Israel will be, you know, that, that God's going to do all these great things for Israel. Don't pray for their good. Because they've been living wickedly. And then verse 12 says, When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, You shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. So God's saying, No, I'm going to bring the sword. I'm going to bring the pam famine. I'm going to bring the pestilence. I'm going to judge them. And... Jeremiah answers God, and he says, well, God, you know, their prophets are saying none of that's going to happen. They're saying that everything's just great. They're saying everything's just fine. Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. It's plain and simple. I didn't tell them any of that. They're lying. They're speaking out of their own heart. He says, I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. There's plenty of people out there today that'll tell you, oh, things are just great. You know, pray for America. Pray to God. Bless us. Oh, pray God. That's not what God's saying. I guarantee you that with all the wickedness that's going on in our society today, God is not saying pray for this people for their good. Yeah. When, when babies are being aborted and killed daily on, on, on this massive scale, thousands and hundreds of thousands, you know, when it's just, when it's happening in the millions every year, when, when the sodomites are just running rampant and boasting in, in their shame and, and promoting their sin and the world starting to accept it and tolerate it and just being embracing of all wickedness and all sin and the divorce rates are up over 50% and the adultery is commonplace in society, God's saying, look, their sin is abounding. Don't pray for their good. They've rejected me. And there comes a point where a people as a whole Reject God. I personally think that the, that the United States has gotten to that point. I think we're beyond that point. Amen. Yeah. It's a, it's a, you know what? It's a sad truth, but it's the truth. 
There was a point in time where, by and large, you could say this was a Christian nation. There was people that feared the Lord. You could look at the laws, and they were more righteous and just. And you could look at the morality, and people actually had respect and fear of the Lord. Not so anymore. Not so. This people loved to wander. So there are people here, it says, pray not for this people for their good. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Another instance, not to pray for, someone's, you know, for someone for good. It says in verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So you're saying, you know what? You see your brother sin a sin, but it's not like, you know, this grievous, abominable sin unto death. Go ahead and pray for it. You know, pray for that person. I'll, you know, I'll give them life. And, uh, but he says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say he shall pray for it. Don't have the pity. Don't be saying, oh, you know, like, They've sinned unto death. They've, they've sinned a grievous sin and they need the righteous judgment and punishment. And that's what we're seeing taught throughout the Bible. Last place we're going to turn, Isaiah chapter 5. I'll close on this. Isaiah chapter 5. We're done. And let me reiterate, I've mentioned this before, I haven't brought it up to, uh, this morning. We need to hate sin. We need to abhor that which is evil. We need to love that which is good. We need to love God. We're, not, we're still not referring to the majority of the people. I say sympathy for the devil, right? Not being sympathetic towards a group of people. It's still a small group of people. Right. Okay, we, and I want to make that abundantly clear because we don't want an imbalance. We do, we ought to be merciful and long suffering and loving and caring and, and you know, and treating people well and, you know, and praying for people and, and everything else and all of the good things. And you know what? I'm probably going to teach on that next week because I just want to make for sure that we're not imbalanced here. The problem is that you know, these events come up and you get attacked and, and these things kind of take our focus and our attention because it's what's going on in our life. And, and there's so many people that are ignorant of this subject that it's, you know, it's wrong and needs to be corrected. And we need to get a proper biblical view of sin, of that which is evil, the types of sin and the types of people that we ought not to be having pity on and praying for and having sympathy for. And that's what I'm trying to do today. But don't just go out of here thinking that, like, well, I'm not going to have sympathy. Either. You brought everything upon yourself and just not, you know, not having any sympathy on anybody for any reason. Right. It's a very specific group and, and small portion of extreme wickedness that we're talking about here. It's talking about people that God has given up on. It's talking about things that, that God says, you know what? There's a sin unto death and just they've done that now and they've made their bed and they've got to lie in it. It's not just everybody for everything. But we're living in a day today, and Isaiah 5, 18, uh, I, think, I think says it appropriately. We're going to read 18 through 24 in Isaiah chapter 5. The Bible reads, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope, that say, Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. 
People start calling good evil and evil good when they get rid of the law of God. And that's what's happening today is that people are saying, oh, you believe that sodomite should be put to death. You're evil. When no, that's good. That's from the law of God. But the reason why they're calling us evil is because they despise the law of God. They want nothing to do with God. They're backwards. But woe unto them. Woe unto them that call good evil. And we're being evil reported of because we believe in the good from God's word. We believe in the good and perfect law of the Lord. <clears throat> but that's what happens when people start calling good evil and evil good and they got their minds backwards, they've got their whole thought processes backwards, sit still. Then what happens, people get sympathetic towards the evil. Instead of abhorring and hating that which is evil, and will have nothing to do with it and being intolerant of the wickedness and the evil that's abounding, they say, well, it's not so bad. Oh, that's actually good. I mean, where, where do you think you know, gay pride comes from? The sodomite pride. They're exalting it. They're saying, no, this is actually great. Come on out and join us. Yo, this is awesome. Accept us. This is great. This is who I am. Instead of being ashamed... And everyone else saying, you're wicked and perverts. Get back in the closet. We don't want to see any of your filth. And actually, we're going to start listening to God's perfect law. That would be the right way. But, you know, it's a backward society. And God help us in these last days. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the perfect law that you've given us. Lord, help us to be able to strike the proper balance in our lives here, Lord. Help us not to, to succumb to the brainwashing that's going on in, the, in this liberal world of people wanting to tell us that we need to uh, tolerate and accept all manners of wickedness and sin, dear Lord. Help us to abhor that which is evil and to not be influenced and um, perverted in our own judgment, dear Lord, because of, of people who want to justify their sins. Lord, help us to keep this um, our own lives as pure as we can and... Um, Help us just to, to love you appropriately, dear Lord, that, um, that you come first in our life and that we hate the, the things and the people that are trying to destroy your word, destroy your work, and uh, destroy your law, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.